anarchy, ever reviled, accursed, ne'er understood. Thou art the grisly terror of our age. Wreck of all order, cry the multitude. Art thou and war and murder's endless rage. O oh, let them cry to them that ne'er have striven the truth that lies behind a word to find. To them the word's right meaning was not given. They shall continue blind among the blind. But thou, O oh word, so clear, so strong, so pure, thou sayest all which I for goal have taken. I give thee to the future, thine secure, when each at least unto himself shall waken. Comes it in sunshine, in the tempest thrill? I cannot tell, but it the earth shall see. I am an anarchist, wherefore I will not rule, and also ruled I will not be. John Henry Mackay You're listening to the Greening Out Podcast. This show contains profanity, hate for the state, and themes of a libertarian nature. If you are easily offended, please listen to something else. For more, visit greeningoutpodcast.co.uk. Hi, I'm Katie Green. Hi, I'm Dan Green. And welcome back to the Greening Out Podcast. Now, today we're going to be talking about the anarchist activist and writer Emma Goldman. And joining us to do that is Keith Preston from AttackTheSystem.com. Now, Keith has actually written an introduction uh, to an edition of Goldman's Anarchism and other, eth- other Essays. Keith, thanks so much for coming back on the show. Thank you for having me back. <laughs> it's always great to talk to you. Um, now, before we get started, some people might be raising their eyebrows because, you know, Katie and I identify as libertarians and we would say we're anarcho-capitalists, so people might be wondering why we're yeah. going to do a show about a socialist. Well, sure, there's some things we disagree with Emma Goldman on, of but because she wrote, wrote on a variety of like quite a vast variety of topics there's oh, yeah. a lot of stuff that we find inspiring and a lot of stuff we completely agree with so just to dismiss someone as oh a socialist would be to miss out i just wanted to put that in before we get started <laughs> <laughs> so uh keith for anybody listening who might not be aware of um who she is do you want to tell us a little bit about who emma goldman was and how you became familiar with her work Well, Emma Goldman was a leading figure in the classical anarchist movement of the uh, early, late 19th and early 20th century. Um, She, uh, well, first of all, a lot of people today don't realize that anarchism was actually a very large movement during that time period. Um, It was uh, never large enough that it actually became the dominant political force in any particular nation or anything like that. But it was a very, very large movement. It was well known. Uh, it had millions of adherents all over the world. Um, it was particularly common in certain Western European countries, um, parts of Latin America, to a lesser degree in North America, and, and even in places like China. Um, and Emma Goldman emerged in the early 20th century as a leading anarchist activist. I, I wouldn't go so far to say if she was really one of the major theorists of classical anarchism. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, there, there were the, the 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 general the anarchist movement had certainly begun before Emma Goldman came along. It has its roots going back to really the early to mid nineteenth century in Europe, um, and other thinkers like Proudhon, Bakunin, Kropotkin had mm. uh, laid out the theory behind classical anarchism. But Emma Goldman really was someone who helped to popularize classical anarchism as a type of uh, as a movement. She was an activist. Uh, she was. Um, a public speaker. Uh, she was a journalist. She was a labor organizer. She was also a political prisoner at various points. Mm-hmm. Um, had her share of run-ins with the state directly. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And she probably did as much as anyone to popularize uh, the, the whole idea of anarchism during that time. And in, in fact, in, in, certainly in the United States at one point, she was really the public face of anarchism. When people thought of anarchism, they thought of Emma Goldman. Mm-hmm. Um, and her, while she wasn't really one of the major theorists of anarchism, um, she also wrote a fairly large amount of um, work on anarchism and its application more on a practical level and uh, she was something of a social critic uh, from an anarchist perspective. Um, the book that you, you mentioned in the introduction, um, Anarchism and Other Essays, that's a uh, reprint of a book that she initially published back in 1910, uh, which in turn, it was, a, it was a collection of essays that she had originally written for the, the, her, uh, her magazine, Mother Earth. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I wrote a new introduction for it, um, which uh, sort of, you know, offers some context and things like that uh, as terms of what she's talking about in some of these uh, writings, because some some of it is a bit dated now, given that mm-hmm. it's a uh, uh, hundred years have passed. But also, it's interesting uh, to see how relevant uh, some of this still remains. Uh, but Emma was a, a leading anarchist uh, of the; she was probably most well known during the 1910s, 1920s, uh, and uh, really today, uh, when you talk to younger people that are interested in anarchism, particularly. Those on the on the left end of, of anarchism, uh, if they if you ask them to name a famous historical anarchist, this probably will be the one that they mentioned, uh, um, Emma Goldman or perhaps Bakunin or someone like that. She's she's a very very important figure in anarchist history. Yeah, and uh, absolutely. absolutely. And um, so we wanted to kind of like. I know what you mean about some of anarchism and other essays being a bit dated because she is sometimes talking about things that were happening around about that time yeah. and if you don't have the kind of context you can kind of be a bit confused at times as to what exactly she's referring to. Um, but So Keith, from my reading, um, just to take it back to the start, it was really the Haymarket riot or the Haymarket affair that got whichever you want to call it, which um, got Emma Goldman originally interested in anarchism. Could you tell us a bit about the Haymarket Riot and what that was? Yeah, uh, that was an incident that occurred in the United States, in Chicago, uh, in the in the city of Chicago in 1886, I believe it was. Um, Emma Goldman was originally from Lithuania. Uh, she... Uh, grew up there and came to the United States as an immigrant when she was in her late teens. And it was about the same time that the Haymarket affair actually happened. Uh, what Haymarket was, was um, essentially there was a, a, labor, um, a labor demonstration going on um, and someone threw a bomb or detonated a bomb. It was an act of what we today call terrorism. Mm. Uh, and uh, some people were killed. Some police officers were killed. And there was a group of about, um, I, I think there was six or seven anarchists who were uh, accused of this crime, and they were sentenced to death by hanging, and, and they were eventually executed. Um, it was widely believed that they were innocent of this, that they were simply framed for having been anarchists. Um, there, there are people who 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 dispute that, but uh, but that but but these uh, these individual anarchists who uh, were executed as a result of the Haymarket bombing became uh, martyrs in a way for the anarchist cause. Um, and this incident happened not long after Emma Goldman had come to the United States, and she was relatively well, very young at the time, probably in her late teens. And this is what first really motivated her interest in anarchism. I think she had become. Uh, familiar with radicalism in in Lithuania because uh, a lot you know because Lithuania is, is close to Russia, there was a lot of radicalism uh, brewing uh, in in Russia during that time in the late 19th century. But this was really her uh, introduction to anarchism, the Haymarket event. Um, a lot of other uh, well-known historical anarchists are. Um, were associated with the uh, the Haymarket affair. Uh, Lucy Parsons, for example, who was another um, very uh, influential figure in anarchist history, uh, her husband, Albert Parsons, was one of the Haymarket martyrs. Um, so, uh, yeah, as you said, that really was the beginning of Emma's interest in, in anarchism. Yeah, and then I believe it was from there she, and she actually mentions this in the preface to Anarchism and Other mm-hmm. Essays, that um, she went to hear Johann Most 
TikTok, and she, he would really inspired her. And um, it was around about that time she also met Alexander Berkman. And Keith, he was going to be very important in Emma's life, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, well, Emma, I mean, uh, Alexander Berkman was uh, at the fellow at the time a young a young guy as well. He was in his uh, mm. early twenties, uh, and he was also um, an immigrant uh, from. Uh, from from either I forget if he was from Russia or from Eastern Europe, but um, but he and um, he and um, Emma also <clears> had in common the fact that they were both Jewish. They both came from a, a Jewish background, mm-hmm. uh, and they met uh, when they were both very young in their early twenties, and uh, they got involved with the the anarchist movement as it was at the time. Um, and the uh, classical anarchism was very oriented towards the labor movement, towards the classical labor movement. That was yeah. the big social issue of the time. What they used to call the labor question or the social question is it was the big. It was it was the issue of the era. Uh, it, you know, it was the era of the the classical labor movement, class struggle, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and all radicals in those days had that as their primary orientation. Um, so uh, they they were involved in the labor movement. Uh, there there was a strike, um, in um, going on at the time in, in the United States against oh. the indus- against the industries that were um, owned by Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie was a uh, he he still is a, a well known a le- well he's a legendary industrialist from American history. He was one of the uh, uh, famous uh, robber baron industrialists, as, as we call them in the United States from the late 19th century. But uh, there was a strike against the uh, the Carnegie Industries and uh, in in homes in a place called Homestead, and um, there was an assistant to um, uh, to Carnegie by the name of Frick, a man by the last name of Frick, and the uh, the Carnegie Industries had been involved in a, carrying out a massacre against strikers, which was fairly common back then. Mm-hmm. Like when strikes in those days uh, tended to be very bloody, very violent, and um, workers would go on strike. Uh, private security forces, as well as state militias, the National Guard, the Army would come out and shoot at them. You know, worker militias would shoot back. Uh, there would be bombings and dynamite set off, and you know, that that kind of thing was not uncommon at all. Um, and the um, the there ha- there was a strike, and the there was a massacre of some workers who had gone on strike, including some children. Um, and uh, in in retaliation for this, um, Alexander Berkman carried out a, an, an assassination attempt against Frick, who was uh, an, an ass- basically was the top lieutenant to Andrew Carnegie. Mm-hmm. Uh, unsuccessfully, as far as as killing the the man, he wounded him, uh, and he ended up uh, in prison. He spent about fifteen years in prison. Uh, but even while he was in prison, he he did quite a bit of anarchist writing that was later published. In fact, he has a uh, there's a book by Alexander Berkman. It's called Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist. He's, you know, he's writing about prison life, uh, and he became, you know once he was released from his prison from prison about 15 years later, he reunited with Emma Goldman. They continued to be leading anarchist activists for a long time after that. You know, into their old age. I really like that, actually. Um, Dan and I were watching recently a documentary about Emma, and um, it was it was quite. She was a bit, an incredibly passionate person. Would you agree, Keith? Oh yes, very she was, much so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was quite. You know, she was very passionate um, about this about this man and about d- different things in her life. And I I kind of think Emma was like a. She was very defiant, non authoritarian. And do do you think she was like a born anarchist? Because when she was a teenager, uh, she wanted to go with her sister to New York City. She wanted to go. She wanted to move. And her father said, no, you're not doing that. And she said, if you don't do it, I will drown myself in the river. I mean, like, you know, there's such an emo kind of thing. You can totally draw that with like, you know, these little you know, goth kids and stuff. I'm not belittling. I'm just saying that she was so passionate and she was so like, um, kind of OTT and I just love that. And I really think that she was a born anarchist. Um, everything I've read about her and seen of her, um, is incredibly inspiring. And especially as a woman, um, I was not aware of Emma Goldman until 
I started looking into anarchism um, and I was taught all about, you know, f- f- I say quote, quote mar- marks, you know, feminism, the sort of new, new wave feminism and so much of the, um, so much of the importance of the feminist movement, uh, is kind of drilled into us is, um, suffrage, you know, and the right to vote. And it's these women who wanted to be such a part of the state. That's who we were sort of told were the, were the real feminists and the women, you know, who, who fought for your rights. Whereas Emma Goldman was campaigning for birth control, you know, back when this, for women to speak out at all was just this horrifying thing, you know, the late 1800s, you know? Yeah. Well, what, uh, what was being said before was absolutely correct. Um, uh, you asked if, um, uh... Uh, Emma was perhaps bor- born an anarchist. Yeah. Uh, she, the, she, there, I actually came across a quote from her once, and since then I've tried to relocate the source, and I've never been able to do so. Uh, but I remember reading something about Emma Goldman probably mm-hmm. about 25 years ago, where uh, it was where she said that anarchists are born and not made. Uh, they're, they're, you know, that you just have to be born with a certain personality mm-hmm. type or a psychological makeup or something like that to to be an anarchist. That you know that that the there's the spectrum of human personalities, <laughs> and and there are some that will become anarchists or be inclined towards or sympathetic towards anarchism, and there are others who won't be. Um, that that was more or less her theory on that, if I c- recall correctly. And mm-hmm. Sean Gabb from the Libertarian Alliance has, has offered a, a similar theory about mm-hmm. about libertarianism, but. Yeah. Uh, and I think he's probably correct. I, I tend to lean in that direction myself. But, mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, I think Emma. If anyone was born to be an anarchist, it was Emma Goldman. And uh, keep in mind that the environment that she grew up in, um, you know, mm-hmm. being a young woman in Lithuania in Eastern Europe in the late 19th century, uh, you know, was uh, y- it's certainly a culture that's very authoritarian. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, when uh, when she w- she w- when she was in school. Uh, she was she was told by one of her schoolmasters that she would probably end up on the gallows. She would probably end up being <laughs> hung for you know as a, as a criminal uh, later in life. Uh, <laughs> which you know uh, you know realistically it, it almost came to that oh, on yeah, yeah. on several occasions. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think it's yeah it's interesting because she does in many ways resemble the uh, the uh, the very re- uh, rebellious uh, youth subcultures yeah. and a thing that we see today and i think that's one reason why you know um, uh, you know even among some of the anarchist punk rocker types you'll see a you know you'll see a, uh, a little image of emma on on their jacket or something like that oh, yeah. I've, seen, I've seen that kind of stuff before so she's definitely a prototype or even a type of archetype for that kind of that kind of outlook so yeah i mean she 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 was definitely an anarchist of the spirit i mean there there are some Radicals. There are some intellectuals. There are some political theorists who are all intellect. Uh, they they're all um, you know they're all theory. They're all they live mm-hmm. in a world of abstractions. It's all about ideas. Mm-hmm. Uh, while she certainly could could discuss all of that and talk about that, uh, I think she was more an anarchist of the heart, if you will, an anarchist of the of the emotions of the spirit, and that was really what propelled her. Um, and I think that it's for that reason that she was so good at, uh, at popularizing anarchism is because she was such a passionate speaker. She was such a passionate uh, activist. She was such an intense personality. Um, mm-hmm. I, I actually uh, knew an elderly anarchist in, in, the, in the New York City area uh, at one point. Again, this was probably about 25 years ago. I, I knew a couple of, of elderly anarchists who were, you know, at the time were in their 80s, 90s perhaps. Uh, who had been involved in the classical anarchist movement um, in the uh, in the early 20th century, you know, in the 1910s, I guess, or something like that. Um, and uh, one of them, uh, Emma, had actually been his babysitter when he was a little boy. Um, mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. other, the other one knew Emma when he was young, when he was like in his teens, or early 20s. He was a labor militant. But um, one, I know, I know one of them, one of those guys, uh, one of those men actually said he didn't really like Emma that much. He said that he, he, on a personal level, he always thought she was a bit egocentric or a bit mm. vain or something like that. But I think that's something you have to be uh, in a way to really be an effective political activist or uh, yes. a, a popularizer of un, of unpopular ideas. That You can't really be a, a meek person and do, th- do the kinds of things that, that Emma did. I mean, you have to be a type of in-your-face person. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, you know, and there are a lot of legendary stories from Emma's life. Uh, like I know when she was in her early 20s, she and Johann Most uh, actually had a quarrel about something. And I think she pulled a bullwhip on, on him and walked <laughs> with it or something. I do that uh, to Dan all the time. Oh, yeah. I did it this morning. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's a whole movement built up around that nowadays. But uh, but back, back then, <laughs> she uh, – she, uh, but yeah, she, well, later in life she was asked about that, and she said, "Well, what can I say? I was 23 at the time, or something." <laughs> but, so, uh, yeah, but uh, so definitely a very uh, emotionally driven, uh, intense personality. Well, oh, oh yeah, absolutely, and um, oh yeah, we were talking about uh, when well, we mentioned the sort of feminism thing because uh, mm. I noticed that like. Um, re- from reading Emma, she she wouldn't criticize the suffragette like she wouldn't. She distanced herself. Yeah, really. she, she did, didn't she? Would you agree? Keith? I could be wrong though. I don't know. Yeah. I haven't. Um, well, again, context is important. Um, fe- the history of feminism is mm. is, uh, is pretty broad. Um, in the sense that uh, feminism has been around as as long as or longer than, than anarchism has. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, it goes all the way back to Mary Wollstonecraft and other thinkers like that from the, from the 18th century. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's always overlapped to a great degree with anarchism. Uh, you know, keep in mind that Mary Wollstonecraft was married to Will, William Godwin, you know, probably, one of, probably the first anarchist theorist in many mm-hmm. ways. Um, so there, there was always been this overlap. Um, and er, but early, early feminism in the... Um, uh, in the 19th century and on into the early 20th century was mostly about women's rights in a political context like mm-hmm. the right to vote or, or, well, I mean, it wasn't just about the right to vote. I mean, there were other issues as well. There were things like the right to own property, uh, the right to have access to your children in the event of a, uh, of a divorce, uh, mm-hmm. to receive inheritance. You know, there, I mean, the, you know, there were economic rights and personal rights as well involved in that. Uh, keep in mind that in some of these older societies, um, you know, if a, if a man divorced his wife, he could just take the kids. She could never see them again in some instances, or e- even if that wasn't really legally permissible, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't anything anyone would ever do about it. Um, or, um, um, you know, women, women really were second class citizens in many of these older societies. And, and you know, and, and, it, and it's similar to what you find in some parts of the world today. You find you find that in parts of the Middle East, for example, in Africa. Um, some Asian societies. Uh, so, you know, I mean, so, uh, so these are real issues. Um, but mm-hmm. it's also true that Emma Goldman was very critical of the suffragist movement, which was mm-hmm. mostly about the right to vote. Uh, that movement tended to be made up primarily of middle to upper class women yes. uh, who, who wanted the right to participate in politics and be in the state, you know, vote for politicians and run for offices and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Emma was critical of that on a lot of grounds. Uh, one was that she just simply didn't believe in the state, and she's, you know, was like, "Why do you want to participate in the state? That's the mm-hmm. enemy." Uh, that mm-hmm. was one on anarchist grounds. Um, also, um, she also thought that it w- it reflected uh, a tremendous class bias. He thought she thought that the um, um, suffragist movement represented a tremendous class bias because she used to say, you know, Lemma used to say basically, this is middle class and wealthy women who want the right to participate in politics. Mm -hmm. This doesn't do anything for women who work in the factories, for women who are homeless. Uh, And keep in mind, you know, poverty, even in the Western world in the early 20th century, was real poverty. Uh, You know, it was it was the era when when working people still worked 10, 15 hours a day in mm-hmm. in industrial fa- in factories where you know you, uh, there's no ventilation and it's 110 degree heat inside <laughs> things like that. I mean, uh, so po- poverty in those. I mean, I mean, pov- not to say poverty is not a serious problem now, but poverty, <laughs> poverty in, the, in the Western world. It, um, it doesn't mean what it really means. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm a sociologist. In the field of sociology, we make a difference between what we call relative poverty and mm-hmm. absolute poverty. Mm-hmm. Much poverty that we see in the Western world today is relatively is relative poverty, in that it's yeah, yes, you have a system of social stratification, and there is wide disparity of wealth, um, and there are people who who struggle in an economic sense. But then there's absolute poverty, and that's poverty mm-hmm. of the type you find in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, 
um, you know, the so-called third world or the underdeveloped countries where light, you know, poverty is life threatening. Um, mm-hmm. But poverty could be life threatening uh, in, 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 in those days, uh, e- even in the Western industrialized societies. Uh, and, and that was much of Emma's uh, criticism of the suffragist movement. Uh, her, mm-hmm. her, her view was this does, does nothing for the working conditions of women workers. This does nothing to help the uh, position of uh, women who are starving. Uh, it, it reflected a tremendous mm-hmm. class bias. You know, she she in, in many ways she viewed the suffragist movement as a as a pet project of of women who were already privileged or who certainly came from the privileged classes. Mm-hmm. Um, that was another objection she had to the suffragist movement. Uh, yet another objection she had, and I think she was cer- turned out to be somewhat prophetic on this, is that she was concerned that the maternal instincts that women have would lead middle class liberal and socialist women to vote to expand the power of the state um, mm-hmm. she believed that uh, that you know women you know by by nature or by socialization or whatever you know do have a uh, tend to have a maternalistic nature you know caring for children things like that yes. she was concerned she was concerned Emma was concerned that women would take that kind of psychological outlook uh, fr- uh, psychological framework and transfer it to politics, where they wouldn't they wouldn't distinguish between the personal and the political, uh, so to speak, and and they would essentially want the state to become everyone's mother. Um, and uh, you know we see we see you know that she was somewhat correct about that when we see mm-hmm. the nanny state that we have today. Like um, you know I I don't know how it is in Scotland, but here in America, you know. Th- we now have laws saying you have to wear a seatbelt, or they're, they're oh, increasingly yeah. trying to keep you from smoking. Or, uh, you know, America has insane alcohol laws. You know, not a, we had alcohol prohibition uh, yeah. for for about 15 years back in the 1920s, 1930s. Um, you know, we've got the war on drugs, which is really uh, an American creation. Um, mm-hmm. so we have we've had this insane uh, nanny state uh, for quite some time, and it seems to get worse all the time. And and that was a big part of what Emma was concerned about. She was concerned, for example, that that women would use the vote to enact consensual crime laws. She was particularly concerned about the support of women's groups and suffragist groups for prohibition, for alcohol prohibition, which was a movement mm-hmm. at that time. Um, you know, as, as well as banning gambling and you know what, what libertarians call the victimless crimes and all of that. So, um, you know, yeah. So for all of these reasons, uh, personal liberty, uh, class issues, uh, just opposition to the state generally, uh, Emma expressed a very um, uh, unsympathetic view of of the suffra- of, of the suffragists. Um, mm. she, she, in many ways, I think she thought it was irrelevant. You know, <clears throat> she's like, well, the real struggle is against the state, and 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 also. Uh, you know, against capitalism and organized religion and that kind of thing. And, and I think she looked at it like, uh, uh, you know, why do you want to participate in the state? You know, the state's the enemy. It, it's, it's the same critique in many ways that the anarchists had of the socialist parties and the labor mm-hmm. parties. You know, why do you want to take over the state and have a worker state? The state is the, state is the problem. Yeah. And, um, well, I think she kind of understood that it, it doesn't matter, you know, if you have men or women, you know, voting. It's the or same anything. structure. It's yeah, the so same it, it's um, not, power structure. Yeah, it's not getting a different. It's not getting a different gender in or a different gender. It doesn't matter what the vote. genitalia of the <laughs> horrible leader is. It's just that they are. It's tyranny. Yeah, they're That's looking at the matters. wrong thing. Yeah, basically, the the problem is the state mm-hmm. and. She she well she really understood that. <laughs> yeah, and way ahead of her time as well. I mean, you know, um, an interesting thing, uh, Keith. We're talking a little bit earlier um, about kind of you know gender roles and women. Um, I just wanted to kind of talk about at at certain points in her life, Emma was married. She never really um, went into kind of. Uh, she was sort of a motherly person from what I can gather. She was quite loving and nurturing to the people around her. Um, but she never explored motherhood. Um, do you think that's because perhaps there was this idea that um, you cannot be um, in and out of jail, being an activist, uh, you know, um, speaking at rallies in front of thousands of people and still kind of have a family do you think that she sort of maybe sacrificed that side of, uh, you know, that old cliche, if you will, of at the time women really were? I mean, they just made made babies, <laughs> really. But uh, yes, what, how? What do you think about that? 
Yes, yes. Um, if you if you read the the writings of some of the the feminists uh, from that particular time period, particularly some of the anarchist feminists like Emma, uh, and also like uh, Voltairine de Clare, uh, you, you see that they had a critique of family life and marriage as it was at the time, uh, where it really was con- uh, a form of uh, it was a form of female slavery, if you will. Um, that because keep in mind that uh, during that time women were largely considered property of their husbands. Uh, mm-hmm. may, maybe not in a literal sense where they, you know, the husband could sell his wife or something like that. It wasn't quite that extreme in the Western world in the, in the a hundred years ago. Uh, but it really was the case that women were second class citizens in a political and legal context. They were considered legally, you know, certainly economically and, and socially subordinate to men. Um, and, that was the expected role of women. Women got married. They started cranking out babies. That's what they did. Um, uh, many of the anarchist women rejected um, uh, that kind of role. And for that reason, they rejected getting married, uh, having children of their own and things like that. Um, because that was just the social context in which that occurred, in which it was expected. Uh, you know, um, in, in the case of Emma, I don't know that she ever commented on this publicly, but I, I would certainly uh, imagine that someone like her, who was um, very, very active in, in, in political radicalism, uh, you know, essentially as a career, as a profession, uh, who had frequent run-ins with the law, uh, who was constantly faced with physical danger as well. Um, there mm-hmm. were people who didn't like anarchists back then. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. and, and, uh, that, so someone who was constantly facing physical danger, mm-hmm. run-ins with the law, uh, imprisonment, uh, who wanted to be a full-time activist, obviously you couldn't really do that and have a child and, or, and, and, and have children and raise children at the same time. Uh, mm-hmm. That wasn't really uh, suitable for domestic life. It wouldn't be today, and, and certainly it wasn't back then. Um, so I'm sure somewhere along the line she made the conscious decision that no, you know, having uh, – being married, having a, a, a family life and children was not really the route for her. And it may have been something of a political statement as well. Again, you know, <clears throat> that was not uncommon among the, the some of the anarchist women of the time. There was something I kind of wanted to explore, um, how she was incredibly uh, uh, verbally anti-war. And she did talk about that quite a lot, and she kind of likened it. She, Dan, was it not? I'm paraphrasing because I can't, I don't have it in front of me, but I believe it was something like um, it's uh, something between two masters. It's a quarrel between two masters. Oh, or it was a, It wasn't her on her quotes. It was a quote she was using, wasn't it? And it was the um, um, what is a quarrel between two masters? And I'm paraphrasing who are like too cowardly to actually fight themselves. Uh-huh, it's like but, about having the common man, the working man. Yeah, because she discussed a lot of this in um, her, you know, her her article, uh, "Patriotism: A Menace to Liberty." Oh yes, and yeah, which was and, which and I still think I think a lot. Of, I think it's still a completely even though so it's, there's a lot of facts and figures about military yeah. build up at the time, and yeah. I, I still find like her anti-war stuff like that really um, just so powerful and so relevant. Uh, what do you think, Keith? Yes, well, yes, yeah, she was a very hardcore anti-war activist. She was as uh, passionate about her anti-war activism as she was about her labor activism or her feminism or anarchism or, or whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, her her critique of war and and the standard anarchist critique of war was that mm-hmm. war was simply something where uh, the the capitalist classes or the state sent the working class off to fight on their behalf. Um, keep in mind that, like I said earlier, this was the era of the classical labor movement, and uh, the 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 uh, general line among labor labor radicals was that the workers have no country or the workers have no state. Uh, that the workers should practice solidarity against the bosses across national borders and cultural bo- borders and things like that. Uh, and meaning that when countries went to war with each other, workers should not participate in or support the, the wars of their respective states. Uh, instead, they should resist war because, in their view, war was the state uh, sending its subjects off to fight on their behalf. Uh, and you know, in other words, what's in it for us? You know that uh, that you know that there's nothing. It, 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 wars between states were not beneficial to the working mm-hmm. people or even common people on any level. Uh, and um, 
during Emma's lifetime, uh, keep in mind that when she, at the height of her well uh, fame, uh, that was the time that the First World War began. Uh, the fir- and the First World War was at the time the biggest war the world had ever seen. Uh, and it, w- it occurred after a time of relative peace, uh, at least in Europe. Uh, and when the war broke out, when, when the First World War broke out, uh, one thing that was interesting about this, and this had a lot of far-reaching ramifications in a lot of ways, but one thing that was interesting is how the socialist parties in virtually all of the countries, all of the European countries, supported their respective states against uh, the other states. For example, you had the, the, uh, the SPD, the German Social Democratic Party, voting for war credits to allow the, the, uh, the German state to go to war and backing the German state uh, in World War I. You had the French Socialist Party backing the, the French state. Um, you, you even had some anarchists that got caught up in this. Uh, Sebastian Farr supported the French state against the, uh, in, in, uh, in World War I. Kropotkin even supported the, Ru- the, uh, the Russian state uh, against the Germans. Uh, it, it, ironically, it was the American radicals in many ways who were the most outspoken opponents of World War I. For one thing, America didn't enter the war until, until later. Um, but uh, the, the Socialist Party here uh, in, in, in the United States did not support the war, and its leader, uh, Eugene Debs, was put in prison for 20 years for making an anti-war speech. And the anarchists were very outspokenly opposed to the World War I, to American entry in World War I. They organized anti-draft protest and anti-war protest. They assisted mm-hmm. draft resistors. They encouraged draft resistance. <clears throat> they encouraged strikes by workers in industries that were engaged in war production. Uh, and for this reason, uh, Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman were actually deported from the United States. They were they were actually deported uh, uh, after I think Emma had been had been in the United States for something like 36 years mm-hmm. yeah. at that point and was actually sent put, um, deported to Russia. And this was not long after the Bolshevik Revolution mm. uh, had happened. Um, so, uh, yeah, Emma's anti-war uh, work was as, as much a part of her, her, her anarchism or her uh, career as a radical as anything. Yeah, absolutely. Um uh, the, I found the quote, actually, the quote is, it's from Carlyle, and it is, What is a quarrel between two thieves, too cowardly to fight their own battle? Therefore they take boys from one village and another village, stick them into uniforms, equip them with guns, and let them loose like wild beasts against each other. <laughs> and um, that's, obviously she's quoting Carlyle and stuff there, and I find that when I read her work, I mean, don't you think, Keith, that she was so incredibly well-read because she's always, like, you know, quoting people like Nietzsche and things like that, and it really comes, her intelligence really comes out and, you know, the depth of um, her knowledge and how much she read, it, you can, it just comes right off the page at you. Oh, yeah, ab- absolutely. Well, like I said before, um, you know, there, there are some radicals, there are some intellectuals who are all intellect, who are all theory, who are all abstractions. And she certainly mm-hmm. had that ability. She could do all of that. But she could also be practical. She could also translate all that into actual action and, and, into, and, and apply it on a more practical level as well. She had that rare ability to do both to be an intellectual and an activist. And I d- there are not a lot of people who can do that. I- I've noticed that a lot of people are either one or the other. Uh, there are people who aren't really that interested in the world of ideas or only as a secondary matter. They're mostly activists. Uh, mm-hmm. And then there's other people who are mostly intellectuals, and they don't really do a whole lot of, in the way of actual action. Uh, she did both and, and did both very well. It's interesting when you're talking about that. It just reminded me there was a, a young man, I don't have his name in front of me, um, who assassinated President McKinley. And um, he claimed that Emma Goldman, the, no. her words had set him on fire. Um, do you have, do you have thoughts about that? Do you think that was a, a somewhat a con- sort of just to make anarchism look bad? Like this is what anarchism leads to? Or I think, was, was, he was there ever me- an issue like was that? Was he not mentally unwell? Keith, you could expand on that. Yeah, the, uh, the incident was, um, uh, the assassination of President William McKinley, mm-hmm. uh, of the United States. And he was assassinated by a man named Leo, Leon Shawgaz. Um, uh, Leon Shawgaz was a Polish immigrant. Um, and Leon Shawgaz claimed to be an anarchist, or I believe he claimed that he had been inspired to uh, assassinate um, 
President McKinley after hearing an Emma Goldman speech or something like that. Um, the um, Leon Shawgaz had a history of mental illness. He clearly was not a mentally stable person, uh, and there's no evidence that he was mm-hmm. his. The assassination itself was any was part of any kind of organized conspiracy by anarchists or anything like that. Now, I do have to qualify that by saying that anarchist terrorism did exist on uh, back in those days. Uh, there were anarchist groups that did advocate what, and and practice what we today we call terrorism, and there mm-hmm. were assassinations of prominent figures, public officials and, and heads of state and, and things like that, that were carried out by anarchists. Um, uh, the McKinley assassination was one, and there were some others as well, uh, as well as bombings. Um, you know, there was a, a group um, in the, a little, uh, this, this was a little bit after the Shawgals incident, but there was, a, there was a group in the United States called the Gallianistas. They were a uh, um, a, an Italian anarchist group that did believe in things like assassinations, bombings, robbing banks, um, that kind of thing. And you find that you find those kinds of tendencies in all radical political movements. Every radical political movement I've ever uh, read about or know anything about ha- always had a strand to it like that that believed in using terrorism or, or mm-hmm. you know, what, what would otherwise be considered criminality as, as a means of advancing the cause. So you find that among the Marxists. You find it among religious uh, fundamentalists. You find it among the far right. Uh, you know, it's, it's not uncommon. But there mm-hmm. were strands to that in class, of that in classical anarchism. And, and there were some that practiced terrorism, violence, bombings, assassinations, armed robbery. Uh, and uh, Leon Chagall was one of those. And he, although he apparently acted on his own, there's no evidence that he was a part of any actual group. Yeah. Um, he, he was, you know, the, the lone nut or whatever, as, as they call them here in the States. Um, but, uh, but the anarchists were blamed for that. They were blamed for the assassination of President McKinley. And uh, uh, in particular, Emma Goldman was blamed. Um, mm. And there was a wave of state repression against anarchists after that. Uh, in, fact, they, they, in fact, the American government passed a law after that uh, that's still on the books today, t- technically, uh, that actually bars anarchists from in, in, entry into the United States. Um, mm. Oh my goodness! Really? Yes. Yeah. That's that's uh, you know there's a, um, they, well in those days the United States was experiencing a large wave of immigration from from Europe, um, and you know there was a, a an anti-immigration movement in the United States as well. In particular, what a lot of people didn't like is that uh, immigrants who advocated radical political philosophies like mm-hmm. anarchism, socialism, communism, were be, were immigrating from Europe. So they actually passed a law barring radicals from from immigrating, uh, and, and they particularly they named anarchists in the actual legislation. It's never it's never actually been. Yeah. Re- in fact, there was an incident um, a few years ago, I think, where a European anarchist, contemporary European anarchist. Uh, was actually barred from entry into the United States. He was coming here for a, an anarchist conference or something like that. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, of course, this was has been since the uh, America's war on terrorism has, has gotten underway uh, mm. and all of that. So that, that's, you know, that kind of thing is an issue even today. Um, but there was a wave of state repression against anarchists in the United States after this, and the anarchists were blamed for this. Uh, and it, it um, and you know, there were there were vigilante attacks on anarchists and, and things like that. So um, it, it, it was it, it's a major incident in in the history of anarchism. Yeah, and I was going to say I find it quite interesting how um, they were blaming her, and it's almost like how we see, for example, sometimes musicians like Marlon Manson was blamed for the Columbine, you know, high school shooting, or you know, some people blame violent video games, and it seems like that's just it's always been going on. But you were saying that there was genuine um, terrorists who were uh, in anarchist groups, but. Emma, in her writing, also mentions about um, police infiltrators in a lot of these anarchist groups, and actually she talks about you know them causing trouble, um, and basically so it will be blamed on the anarchists. Do you know much about that? Yeah, well, that's always been a common practice. Uh, whenever you have, in, in a particular society, radical political movements developing that are opposed to the state or to the status quo or whatever, the ruling class, whatever you want to call it, um, obviously, the authorities don't take kindly to that, um, and they will often infiltrate dissenting movements like that for the p- purpose of disrupting them and or or generating bad publicity for them or steering them into run-ins with with the with the law and things of that nature. 
Uh, there was a lot of that in the United States in the 1960s. <clears throat> Uh, in the 1960s, there was a lot of there were a number of radical groups that developed in the United States that were opposed to the war in Vietnam. Groups like mm, the yeah. the uh, the uh, the Black Panthers uh, were one. The 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 yeah. youth the yuppies, the Youth International Party, uh, the Students for a Democratic Society, uh, and there were groups within those movements that really did advocate or practice terrorism as well. For example, the 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 Weathermen really did advo- um, bomb buildings and things like that. It really happened. Um, but uh, it was also true, though, that there were police infiltrators into those organizations uh, that did try to act as a disruptive force, create division within the um, within the organizations, um, uh, create uh, create violent conflicts between rival factions within the organization. Uh, and engage in acts of violence and then blame it on the organization and make the you know, for the sake of generating bad publicity. Uh, that kind of thing is very common. Uh, there was, in fact, the uh, the FBI, uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigation in the United States in the 60s, had a, a program called COINTELPRO, with a counterintelligence program, mm-hmm. and that was a big part of what they were doing is, is infiltrating with the purpose of disrupting these kinds of groups. Uh, now, I don't know as much about uh, how that worked during Emma Goldman's time, but it's it's a it's an age old. Uh, practice that states have, have frequently engaged in. Um, so you know, and that you you, you uh, I, I also in the United States in the in the 1990s we had the uh, the militia movement, which is a movement from the right, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and and they and there were strands of that that were involved in terrorism as well. There was a bombing in Oklahoma City. They blew up a, a, gov- a government building, killed mm-hmm. over 100 people. Um, so <clears throat> that kind of thing really does <clears throat> happen. Uh, but there were also within that movement there were there were uh, undercover agents, uh, informants, infiltrators, and so forth that were doing these same kinds of things. So it's it, it's an ongoing it's an ongoing thing that states practice. There's nothing particularly unusual about it. Now, Keith, um, I just wanted to kind of change it up a little bit, um, <clears throat> go off course a bit, talk about well, not really off course because we were talking about it earlier. The fact that. Um, Free speech. Emma was uh, a big advocate for things like uh, birth control for women, and she she often spoke in front of um, thousands and thousands of people, um, uh, and she would really uh, r- r- rile up a crowd. Um, and that is so relevant today, especially. I mean, we've had these terror attacks in uh, in Paris recently. That's uh, really sparked a debate over free speech and what constitutes free speech and um, I remember, uh, I, I, again, paraphrasing, I can't, I don't have it right in front of me, but I remember Emma saying how, uh, she was jailed for talking yeah. at one point. <laughs> that's, that's exactly how she said it. She said, I, I was in prison for talking. Um, and it, you know, do you think, uh, well, I don't really know how I'm quite wording this into a question as such. It's just so incredibly relevant today. Sure. Well, in the context of which, uh, in, in the context of, uh, of Emma Goldman's life, when when she was a very strong advocate for freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and things like that, um, and in, in those days, um, uh, and, and one thing she was big on was uh, advocating the right for women to have access to information about birth control. Um, mm. And keep in mind that in the United States, that was actually illegal. In the United States, they actually had a law. It was called the Comstock Law, and it was named mm-hmm. after a man named Anthony Comstock, who was something of a, a moral crusader against vice and sin and things like that. Uh, and the law uh, barred – essentially, it, the, the, the Comstock Law was uh, an effort to impose censorship on pornography. Uh, and in particular, you weren't allowed to, to uh, send – uh, supposedly obscene or pornographic materials through the mail, uh, and that included information about birth control. You know, obviously, to, to really effectively discuss birth control, you have to discuss a lot of things about body parts and, and stuff like that, which, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. In, in, by the standards of that time, at least, was considered pornographic or obscene or, or morally suspect. Um, and uh, so, in, in turn, uh, disseminating about information, it's disseminating information about birth control could get you prosecuted for obscenity uh, during that time. Oh, well, also, birth control itself was considered morally suspect in many ways. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't something like we don't really see much of that in contemporary 21st century Western societies where there are people who want to ban birth control devices or things like that. Uh, but there were 
that there was that back in those days. Uh, in fact, in the United States, and as recently as 1967, some mm-hmm. of the states had laws banning the sale of birth control devices. Uh, there was a landmark Supreme Court decision in the late 60s uh, that overturned some of those laws. Uh, so that's the cultural context, the social context that the legal uh, that uh, the legal context that Emma Goldman was working in. Uh, so she was a big advocate of the right to disseminate information about birth control and and practice birth control uh, within the context of, of free speech. And there was also what they also had in those days what they called the free speech fights, which was basically about the right of labor organizers to make speeches advocating strikes or advocating forming labor unions and things like that. Uh, and keep in mind, in those days, uh, they, they would try to ban speeches by labor organizers uh, on the grounds of sedition or advocating insurrection and things like that. Uh, that was another issue. Uh, uh, war, the anti-war uh, movement was another issue. Uh, anti-war speeches could be banned as advocating treason, subversion, um, like I said earlier, Eugene Debs, who was the uh, leader of the American Socialist Party, was sentenced to 20 years in prison for making an anti-war speech during World War I. Uh, so Emma was a very strong proponent of freedom of speech, and these, and these were all big issues during that time period. Um, in, in the United States, as part of the political traditions of the United States, we have the Constitution's First Amendment, which supposedly guarantees the right of free speech. Uh, that, that's been part of the American Constitution since the 1790s. But what's interesting about it is that it was very rarely upheld on any level at all uh, up until probably the middle part of the 20th century. You start to see, um, you start to see court rulings that, uh, that recognize the legal right to free speech. Uh, in fact, I, I, I don't remember the source of this either, but I remember reading once that the that the it wasn't until about a hundred years after the U.S. Constitution was written that any of the federal courts in the United States actually upheld a free speech case, actually upheld the right to free speech in any particular case. Hmm. Um, and so you in those days, you know, in, in early American society, and I'm sure it was the same in, in Europe as well, uh, you know, you could be sent to, to prison for advocating sedition, you know, subversion, insurrection, uh, all sorts of other things. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and, well, I know it was like that in England. I know during the uh, during World War One, Bertrand Russell was sent to prison for advo- uh, for speaking against the war. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, so sp- free speech was was a big issue uh, in those days. It still is. Uh, you know, it, it, it's really uh, it's really an age old conflict. I mean, if you go back and you read. Uh, ancient writings. I remember reading some uh, some writings by some ancient Chinese uh, uh, philosophers once where they were calling for suppression of free speech and you know because we've got people out here advocating subversion and you know there were and there were other Chinese writers that were saying no we've got to defend the right to uh, express ideas and and you know this was something that was happening in in China you know 2500 years ago. Um, so uh, this is an age-old struggle. And, uh, and Emma was a very outspoken proponent of free speech. And, and, and like you were saying, we see that today uh, as well. Um, uh, in, the, in the United States, free speech is somewhat m- more legally protected than it is in a lot of other places because mm-hmm. of court rulings that have happened in the United States over the past half a century or so, since about, since about uh, you know, since about the... I guess about 1950, something like that, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, and, uh, and I, I think the reason why the American courts will uphold the right to free speech on some level is because of the, the, the American media is so powerful. The, you know, the American mass media is, is, uh, is really the media for the world in many ways. I mean, you can get mm-hmm. American yeah. media anywhere, uh, and because the media is such a powerful institution economically and so forth, I think they're somewhat je- zealous of their defending their own rights to free speech. Uh, but, um, but you know, whatever the case may be, um, we do have in the United States somewhat more well as protected rights for free speech that don't exist in other places. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I know some people, for example, who are associated with a right-wing group that's based in the United States called the uh, National Policy Institute. They recently tried to organize a conference in, in Hungary uh, in the European Union. And, the, oh. and, the, and Sean Gabb from the Libertarian Alliance wrote mm-hmm. a bit about this, but they mm-hmm. were actually – the conference was actually banned, and the fellow who tried to uh, organize the conference was arrested and put in jail. And then was, was that Tom Sinek? 
that was well. That was the uh, Tom Sunick was uh, associated with this group. Rich, mm-hmm. Richard Spencer was the fellow who was actually arrested. Oh, um, okay, yeah. yeah. But uh, but uh, yeah, and then in uh, I've I've noticed from reading about the, the the domestic politics of a lot of European countries that they do have uh, stricter laws concerning things like slander, vilification. Yeah. There's hate speech. Of course, there's promoting uh, you know offensive or controversial. Uh, ideas like Holocaust denial that that is a criminal offense in some of the European mm-hmm. countries mm-hmm. Um, so we, that that kind of thing is much rarer in the United States I mean we do have a a, a legal culture if you will in the United States that is uh, that upholds free freedom of speech to a greater degree for example in, in the United States um, it's not formally illegal to b- belong to any political party or it's not formally illegal to belong to any religion. And that's not uh, the case in some European countries. I think there are political parties that have been banned in some of the European countries. There are, there are religions. I think the Church, mm-hmm. of, China, the Church of Scientology is illegal in, in some of the uh, European countries, for example. But uh, at the same time now, it's also the case, I qualify that by saying that the flow of information is also very tightly controlled in the United States. The American mass media um, is is highly concentrated in terms of control and ownership. You know, virtually all of the American mass media is controlled by a handful of mega corporations. Uh, you know, they they own virtually all of the media. There's the television networks, the newspapers, you know, of that kind of thing. So if you really want to get any dissenting media, you have to go to the internet, and you can get independent yeah. media sources in the United States or international media. Mm-hmm. And then it's interesting if we talk about free speech because you mentioned earlier on that. Emma and Berkman were eventually um, deported to the Soviet Union, and they did not like what the, what they found there when because they met Lenin. yeah, because we, they met Lenin, I believe, and mm. um, they brought up the issue of free speech. And Lenin said there could be no free speech in a in these conditions and these this revolutionary time, basically. And uh, like it's almost as if she kind of saw. Th- everything you know she'd really believed in it you know yeah and then she became very disillusioned yeah. with it didn't she and it must have been difficult yeah well the um the anarchists had always been very critical of marxism uh in a lot of ways if you go back and you read the early polemics between bakunin and marx or even if you go back to look at the and look at the intellectual circle and social circle that that marxism emerged out of um you know, Mark, early on in his life, Marx was part of a, um, a, a group called the Young Hegelians, uh, and he had also been uh, – I don't, no, I don't know if it was the Young Hegelians. It was, uh, it was a group called the Free Ones, I believe, and, uh, and I think Max Stirner had also been a part of this group along with Marx, Karl Marx, and Frederick Engels. Uh, in mm-hmm. fact, the only, the only picture we have of Max Stirner today is a, actually a hand sketch. You know, there was never we don't have any painted portraits of <laughs> Max Stirner, and this was before photography. But so uh, the only picture we have of Max Stirner today is just a little hand sketch that Frederick Engels drew of him about 40 years later. Uh, Stirner had a biographer, an anarchist by the name of John Henry McKay, and uh, mm-hmm. he, because and he wrote a biography of Stirner about 40 years later. Uh, where um, he actually interviewed Engels and said, "What was Sterner like? What did he look like?" And Sterner and Frederick Engels drew out this little uh, <laughs> little hand sketch of, "Well, this is what kind of what Max looked like." But uh, and that that <laughs> and that little that little portrait, that little hand sketch that we see of Sterner today, uh, that that's that was Engels that that drew that. But uh, but if you look at the early polemics between anarchist early anarchist thinkers and the Marxists, you, you see this dichotomy beginning way back then. Mm-hmm. Um, you you know you. You know, Proudhon, Pierre Joseph Proudhon, Max Stirner, and Bakunin were all people who were personally acquainted with Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. They were personal rivals. Uh, they exchanged, you know, uh, polemical bloodshed quite a bit. In fact, uh, uh, Marx's book, *The Poverty of Philosophy*, is actually an attack on Proudhon. The German ideology, to a great degree, is an attack on Stirner. Uh, the the the, the uh, Arguing back and forth between Bakunin and Marx is well known, but but the the anarchists always criticized Marxism on the grounds that Marxism simply wanted to replace one kind of authoritarian state with mm-hmm. another. You know, the the core idea was behind Marxism, as the anarchists understood it, was that okay, the workers are oppressed, 
the state is on the side of the capitalists, so all we need to do is you know, we need for the workers to take over the state and create a worker state. Um, there, there was never any, if you read the writings of Marx, there was never any discussion of what a, an actual worker state would look like. Uh, the, the Marxists didn't think that was important. They thought that the uh, that the state is merely an instrument of class power. So if the workers control the state, well, that's that's all you need, just like the capitalists control the state with capitalism. Um, mm. and Bakunin uh, saw through that early on. He, he said, well, like, like there's this one quote from Bakunin where he's saying of Marx, he said, so, okay, right now there are 40 million Germans. Are there going to be 40 million people? People in the in, in Marx's worker state, um, and and Marxism was always an extremely authoritarian ideology. Um, Marx Mar- Marx himself and Engels were uh, at defenders of, of imperialism. They thought that imperialism was bringing civilization and enlightenment to backward people um, <laughs> throughout the world. Um, uh, and even you know, at the time, the, anar- the anarchists were always very critical of imperialism, of, of, uh, of colonialism, uh, mm-hmm. but the, the Marx and Engels were not. They thought this was progress. They thought that was social progress. You know, they, were, they were like Christopher Hitchens, who said we should bomb the Afghans out of the Stone mm-hmm. Age or whatever. Oh, that's, gosh. That's, that's the outlook that Marx and Engels had as well. Uh, uh, Marx and Engels also were, were racists. Um, in, in fact, mm-hmm. they're, 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 I, I saw, a, I've seen material from... from Racist groups in in Europe in uh, in Eastern Europe and Russia, where they point that out, they'll go back and dig out these quotes from Marx and Engels that showed what they really thought about race. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they, um, you know, they they considered the the indigenous people, for example, uh, to be non historical people. They weren't progressive. They were primitive. Uh, you know, they they hadn't achieved the you know uh, the advancements that came with industrial society, and you know they would be over, over eclipsed with you know, with over time and become extinct, and they were fine with this. Uh, they, um, so, so, you know, they had, you know, they, ironically, they had, a, Marx and Engels had a lot of views on this that would be considered far right today, but, um, mm-hmm. but the, but the anarchists were always strong critics of imperialism, strong critics of war, strong critics of statism, uh, and they, they understood right from the beginning that this is what Marxism in practice would produce, that Marxism in practice would produce an, a new kind of authoritarian state. Uh, that would arguably be just as bad as anything that the capitalists and the kings and, and all of the types of states that they had during that time had, had come up with. Uh, in fact, Bakunin even said that. <clears throat> Bakunin said that uh, Marxism in practice would create a what he called a red bureaucracy, uh, and and that's what it. That's exactly what happened. If you mm-hmm. look at how if you look at how Marxist regimes were organized. You know, the, the, the Bolshevik Revolution was a, was a prototype for all the Marxist revolutions that happened in the 20th century. And most of those countries followed, well, really all of them, followed the same basic model. You had a one-party state that had uh, uh, an, a federation of, of trade unions that were controlled by the state adjacent to it, and independent unions were not allowed. And then you had women's groups and a youth federation and so forth, and all of this is subordinate to the state. No, no opposition parties allowed. The press is controlled by the state. There's no uh, independent press allowed. Uh, the, the, the economy, the means of production or whatever, it, is, uh, is, is nationalized under state control, ostensibly in the name of the workers. Uh, and all of the, the Marxist states were – the Marxist-Leninist states were modeled on the Bolshevik model. It, was, starts with, it really starts with Lenin. And and uh, and you see the same thing in uh, in the Eastern European states uh, after World War II in, in in China in 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 Vietnam and Cuba and all of these places that was, that was, that was the model for Marxist revolution and uh, and, it, and and it was very much the red bureaucracy that Bakunin predicted it would be the the the, base, the method of organization of these states was that you had very um, very highly concentrated bureaucratic entities that control the state. You had this this political and party based and military bureaucracy that was the basis of the state. Uh, and workers, you know, the, the idea that this that these are worker representative states is 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 a bit of a joke. I mean, the, the workers were certainly a, a subordinate class to the military, to the political parties, mm-hmm. uh, and, and to the state bureaucracy itself. There, you know, and, I mean, even in uh, you know, in countries like uh, the Soviet Union, they had special stores where only party members or the party elite could shop and things oh, like wow. that. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Well, I had a I had a friend of mine who, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm 48, so I, you know, I, I, I all through my growing up period, the uh, the Soviet Union and all of that was still intact. Yeah, and uh, yeah. I had I had friends of mine who would visit some of those countries um, in, in in the 80s, and they would tell me about how they would visit East Germany. And they would see, you know, members of the party elite 
driving the Volvos, you know, the expensive Western cars and things mm-hmm. like that, you know, whereas the, the common people, the ordinary people, the workers you know, who are, are driving these, these cheap, you know, crummy model Eastern, Eastern European, um, uh, East German <laughs> automobiles, uh, you know, so it, it was everything that Bakunin said it would be. It was everything mm-hmm. that Bakunin said it would be. Uh, mm-hmm. That's what Marxism was in practice. Um, you know, just about, if you go back and look and see what Mark, what Bakunin said about Marxism and what Marxism would be in practice, that's what it was when it actually came to power, um, and the uh, um, you know when Emma Goldman and Alexander Bergman were deported from the United States, um, they they were sent to the Soviet Union. Uh, and this was probably about two years after the Russian Revolution, well, after the Bolshevik Revolution, mm-hmm. and. Um, and they, you know, they were hoping. Well, maybe you know, maybe this really is going to be a, a socialist society, or you know, a, a libertarian society, or something mm-hmm. like that. But they quickly saw that it wasn't. They quickly saw that the Bolshevik government was basically a, a military dictatorship. Um, and the, um, you know, the, the Bolsheviks would justify their policies on the grounds of, well, we're at war. Uh, you know, it's it's the wartime emergencies and things like mm-hmm. that. But you, you, you also see uh, this uh, historically in Marxist states where there was no war or there was no immediate threat of war, mm-hmm. things like that. So uh, th- th- there just seems to be something that's endemic to Marxist theory that creates this kind of result. Not only does it have this state-centric ideology, <clears throat> but I think the wider philosophy uh, that, that you see that underpins Marxism – uh, is conducive to this because it's it's a very anti-individualist philosophy. It's a Marxism is a mm-hmm. philosophy that says what matters is the collective. You know the uh, very you know, very collectivist. Yeah. 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 What matters is the collective, and the individual really has no identity apart from their identity as a worker or as a social unit. Uh, you know uh, that kind of, the uh, they, you know, of course they have this view that. Uh, Really, that that ideas, that values, that cultures, even individual personalities are an outgrowth of social conditions and and economic conditions. Uh, that that kind of philosophy is not really consistent with creating the cultural foundation or the political foundation that you need for any kind of libertarian society. So it's no surprise that Marx mm-hmm. states out this way. And and you know the the early anarchists saw it right from the beginning, and then Emma Goldman and Alexander Bergman they saw this when they went to Russia in 1919. Yeah. Now I was just going to say, like on on that note, you know, she, she kind of became um, quite a tragic figure. Yeah, after her, the, after they left the Soviet Union. Yeah, yeah, quite a tragic figure in in her old age. Um, and I I I, I understand it, Keith, that she would miss the United States, and she she kind of um she, and even when she was younger, I think I read, you know, that she had a very idealistic view of America and what that offered. You know, in terms of the individual and what she could achieve, and in her old age, I think she was missing that very much. Yeah, because she died in Canada eventually. It was, didn't yes, she? it was. It was in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, she always had uh, um, a mixed view of the United States. Uh, keep in mind that she was from Lithuania. Uh, she came here as a teenager. Mm. Uh, there were a lot of people from Europe. Uh, particularly Eastern Europe and Russia, who came to the United States during that time period uh, because they they knew about the American Revolution. They knew about the ideals that you find in uh, documents that came out of that revolution, like the uh, uh, you know the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, and all that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so a lot of radicals, European radicals in the 19th century, had a very idealistic view of America that was actually very similar to the kind of idealistic view that many radicals had of Russia in the 20th century. Um, mm-hmm. But what would happen is that they would come to the United States, and you know, most immigrants were poor people. They would get jobs in, in the factories in the United States. They would see how awful the working conditions were. Uh, you know, They would see how, uh, if they tried to organize a union or, or protest or something like that, they'd get the, pol- they, the police would be called on them. So you know, that, that created a lot of disillusionment among a lot of these immigrant radicals who came to the United States you know, with, with it saying, well, yes, yeah, the land of the free, but, but only so free. You know, and, I, not, um, and, and Emma was certainly one of those. Uh, that, that was the feeling she had about the United States when she first came. She was like, wow, I'm going to America, the land of Thomas Jefferson. You know, yeah. then, she, then she saw the, you know, the working conditions, the, 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 poli- the actual political conditions as they were and, and so forth. And she was like, well, you know, maybe not. So she, she 
became involved with anarchism and you know and and while I think that she uh I think there were many things about America she actually admired and appreciated uh you know in terms of uh its uh, cultural achievements and, and technological inventiveness and all of these kinds of things. I mean, you know, she was also very critical of the other side of the United States, which is, has always been this kind of uh, uh, class hierarchy and, mm. and, and plutocracy, if you will, and, and you know, as, as well as its, uh, its puritanism. You know, she, we've talked about her crusade for the right to birth control and things like that. Mm. Um, and I think she had the same experience in her old age, ironically, with Russia. You know, the same experience mm-hmm. she had in her yeah. teens in America. She had the same experience with Russia. She went to um, she went to back to Russia and said, "Okay, they've had the revolution. They've got a supposed socialist <laughs> government. Maybe and, it's you know, better now. <laughs> yeah, it's better now." And, and and she went there and found the same thing. Uh, she yeah. found, found the exact same thing. And uh, and she um, and she and Alexander Berkman eventually left. Um, now, Emma Goldman did. Uh, visit Spain during the revolution there, uh, mm-hmm. when the uh, oh, right. Spanish anarchists were actually uh, engaged in the Spanish Civil War and actually carried out something of an anarchist revolution in parts of Spain and Catalonia and Aragon and some other places. Uh, and she did get to see some of that, uh, you know. You know, and I think probably not long before she died, probably with you know, mm-hmm. maybe it was, maybe it was the same year. Um, I think it was 1940. Was it? That's when she died. Yeah, yeah I think so it was 1940. The, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think, but she was in uh, she was in uh, um, Spain in, in 1936 uh, oh, okay. when, yeah. when the revolution happened. Uh, when, when for, you know, briefly, very briefly. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, so she definitely had had a very interesting uh, life, uh, no doubt about that. I wanted just to ask you, Keith, how do you think? I don't know if, if this is quite an an odd uh, question to ask, but how do you think um, Emma would look at sort of modern day? Uh, United States and modern day uh, Europe. Do you what what knowing what you know about her? What do you think she would think of, um, or even mo- modern day sort of activism and anarchism? Ah, uh, well, that's that's an interesting question. I've actually thought about that quite a bit. <laughs> if some of these if some of these old anarchists were were here today, what would they think? You know, like yeah. I, like I said, I actually knew some elderly anarchists in the '80s that had were old. You know, they were they were very old and had actually been part of the historic anarchist movement. Um, and I got to hear their take on that, um, which mm-hmm. was it, it was as I would predict their their take on it was something of a mixed bag. And I think Emma would probably say the same thing if she's here today. Mm-hmm. On one hand, I think she would look at mm-hmm. some of the social changes that have happened in Western societies since her time. And mm-hmm. think it was rather phenomenal. For example, in the United States, the fact that we have a black man as president. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. she, now she yeah. wasn't the she wasn't big on using the state as a means of of, of a, you know obviously she wasn't as big on using the state as a means of promoting social change. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and I I think you know uh, and I think she'd probably say the same thing about someone <laughs> like President Obama that she said that she said about the suffragists in her own time, you know, she said, well, yeah, that, that that's nice, but how does this help the average <laughs> person? How does this help the common person? You know, it's, uh, yeah. but I think she would be certainly be astounded at, at some of the, uh, social changes that have happened, um, in the, in, in, in the Western world since then. For, for example, another thing is Emma was also an early proponent of gay rights, uh, yeah. which, yeah, yeah, yeah. which was yeah. unthinkable and thinkable in those days. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I, you know, she would look at a lot of the cultural and social changes that have happened in the West since then. You know, in areas like race and in, in, in gender roles, and gay rights, in in, uh, in uh, separation of church and state. Uh, you know, certainly the fact that labor unions now have become institutionalized and uh, and are, are part of the establishment in, yeah. in ways, and uh, and the fact that the standard <coughs> living, the standard of living of working people has increased exponentially. Uh, you know, due to a variety <coughs> You know, I think she'd be really impressed with that. And of course, then there's the technology and the science and all of that that we have today. She'd be very impressed with all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, I think she'd, you know, she'd she'd look at the war on terrorism and uh, and and uh, mm-hmm. things like that. And she she'd look at the war on drugs and mm-hmm. look at America's prison system. And you know, she'd look at the attacks on free speech that we've seen uh, in response to the uh, the the Parisian incident. Um, and 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 she say you know it's you know it, it, yeah a lot has changed but a lot is still the same uh, it's uh, and, and you know that and, and I think I think if anything I think she'd she'd see, she'd see it as a vindication of her view that you can't uh, 
reform society by means of the state. You know, she, she, of she, course. I think she'd look at it like, yeah, in the Western world, you've seen certain social reforms and in, in some of these other areas, labor reform and economic reform and, and gender roles and other things. But the state still does what the state always did. You know, the, the, you know, the state still does things like the war in Iraq, the, the, the war on terrorism, you know, the U.S. Patriot Act, you know, Guantanamo, um, all the, all these other things. I, I I like to think she would sort of come back and go, do you people not listen? Do you not see? <laughs> <laughs> this keeps happening again and again. The insanity. But Keith, this has been really good. Really, I really, really enjoyed interesting. this. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, Keith, why don't you tell um, our listeners about attackthesystem.com and what people can find on there? Uh, attackthesystem.com is a website, an anarchist website, that is operated by myself and others. We sort of have a little editorial collective. Uh, it includes information about uh, a wide variety of a- subjects related to anarchism and libertarianism. It's, it's very non-sectarian. It's a very big tent. You know, We uh, are open to ideas from a, a lot of different political tendencies and, you know, involving anarchism and libertarianism. We discuss other ideas as well. Uh, but the general thrust of it is is against the state, uh, uh, anti-authoritarianism, uh, against Big Brother, um, you know, some controversial material. There are people who don't like us, uh, mm. but uh, which I, I'd be surpri- I'd be disappointed if everyone liked us. I, I, yeah, I, it would be boring <laughs> if everybody liked yeah, it. I, I, if we never if we never got any criticism, you know, if I, if I was someone who was universally loved, I, I'd think, well, what am I doing wrong? Yeah, <laughs> I know. Why am I not invoking something in someone? What, what the I hell's mean, happening? Yeah, yeah, and and you know, well, it's also said, you know, you can tell a lot about a person by the people who hate them. You know, so <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, but yeah, attackthesystem.com is a website that's been online for about 15 years, um, and it deals with a lot of subjects uh, pertaining to anarchism, libertarianism, anti-statism, anti-authoritarianism, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, and, and then often in a heterodox way. Uh, we don't have any kind of party line or, or yeah. you know, there's really no idea we will not uh, – mm-hmm approach or, or discuss, um, you know, and, and unlike, um, a lot of anarchist, um, uh, online forums and, and, and activist groups as well. Uh, you know, one thing that I've certainly learned, uh, in being an anarchist is that anarchists can be just as censorious and just as intolerant and, uh, mm-hmm. just as authoritarian <laughs> as any other group of people. I, you know, I, mm-hmm. I think that, I think that's a human problem. I don't think that's something that's endemic to any one yeah. political philosophy. Um, you know, and there are some anarchist groups out there. On, for example, there are some uh, online internet forums of anarchists that you know they will expel you as soon as you deviate from their party line on yeah. on anything. Yeah. Um, that's not how we do it at attackthesystem.com. dot com. You know, for example, if you look at our comments threads, uh, we get trolled by virtually everyone <laughs> from. from- <laughs> From neo Nazis to these these far these far left anti fascist types uh, or mm-hmm. left fascists or whatever they are um, <laughs> and, and everything in between. Um, you know, it's d- definitely a free speech forum. You can also follow me personally on Facebook, just Keith Preston on Facebook, and then the Attack the System has a Facebook page as well, so you can follow all of those forums. That's it's, awesome. And uh, Attack the System is on our resources page, which you can find on our website. Uh, mm-hmm. For more libertarian podcast writings and news, uh, you can go to greeningoutpodcast.co.uk. Keith, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Thanks.